Hey guys, it's Monday, which means it's Mountain Monday, and we're going to um, do a little bit of a different format today. We're going to do our sort of centering, finding our mountain the way we normally do, and then I have some articles to show you guys because I'm trying to sort of keep the concept of Mountain Monday the same, but make it more relevant to try to get the traffic on these videos up. So I'd appreciate it if, if you know, you enjoy Mountain Mondays, if you'd share them to try to get sort of the, the traffic boosted, because they are one of the most, uh, I hear the most about them in terms of, you know, people go breathe in, breathe out and find your mountain, but they're also one of the lowest rated videos each week. So I'd appreciate if you'd share them and uh, thank you in advance. So let's everybody sort of get comfortable, because you know what happens on Mountain Mondays. We... Breathe in, and out, and we breathe in for a zen start to our week, and out, there we go, okay, so everybody's calm, so the, I tend to pick my Monday topics based on whatever insanity I see happening online on the weekends, because I try to avoid social media on the weekends and this is very difficult because you know it, someone always sends me something business related through Facebook or Twitter on the weekend so I have to check it even though I don't want to because you need a break from uh, what we're going to talk about today and that is anger transference and the unique contagious anger of what I call outrage warriors. Some people call them social justice warriors. I don't believe that these particular people have anything to do with social justice. They may speak in the language of social justice, but they don't really have anything to do with it because they're far too angry. Now, I'm going to try to prove that statement in this video. So let's come out of full screen mode. And... Um, the first thing I want to talk about is the, the articles I'm going to show you are all from the same guy, uh, Leon F. Seltzer. He's a psychologist, so he knows a lot more about this stuff than most people. Uh, and he has done this series of articles on anger. It's from 2013, but that gives it, I like using slightly older articles because it gives time to see whether they're actually going to hold up or not something new. It hasn't necessarily been tested. So, you know, something two years old, it's still, to me, modern enough to be relevant, but it's been around long enough to be tested. So I sort of like that. I look for things that are maybe three, to a, three years to a year old for stuff like this. But as you can see, we're going to talk about how we transfer feelings of guilt, hurt, and fear. But I want to talk first about the unique type of anger we see in outrage warriors or as you guys call them sjw's and how that anger jumps to other people and the thing about as you'll see in this article whoops anger is unquestionably the most moralistic of emotions that is angry people almost always experience their anger as fully justified that they're clearly in the right about whatever has upset them as though god himself must surely be aligned with them Sound familiar? So once this emotion breaks out of its cage, it can be extremely difficult to get it back inside without refocusing your attention on what distressful feelings it may be camouflaging. Sound familiar? Then, of course, you'll be required to deal with and resolve this concealed emotion. For example, you'll need to find realistic ways to reassure yourself that you're not without value, that your anxiety doesn't signal some imminent danger. If you're able to effectively confront the emotion cloaked by your anger, you'll find that such anger will dissipate, if not disappear altogether. Now, in, in the gaming community, we are locked in a cycle of anger that can't dissipate. It just keeps bouncing back and forth. And the reasons for that we'll talk about when we get to the transference part of this. But like I said, this is about the unique form of anger that the whole outrage culture and outrage warriors brought 
into this debate. And the, the thing I like about this article is that it has what's called an anger thermostat. And, you know, it starts at 12, infuriated, raging, red boy, explosive. You notice outraged is the second one down. It's only, it's an 11 out of, 11.5 out of 12. So 11.5, higher than 10, you know. Um, go ahead, make your gone home review jokes now. I will not be outraged because I know it's a joke. But you'll notice that the place that social justice warriors tend to sit, outrage warriors tend to sit, is around a 9.5 on the anger scale. And I say this because of the description of vengeful. For an outrage warrior, it's not enough to be, you know, agitated or hostile. They need revenge. Somebody has to pay. Somebody has to lose their job. Somebody has to grovel. Someone has to hurt. That, if you'll notice, on a 12-point scale, they're constantly sitting at a 9.5. That's a very angry person. And we're seeing this from their behavior. You know, the, the vengefulness that we see, that's a lot of anger. You know, and when they hit full-blown outrage, we get that, you know, shaming and, and screaming and condemning and, you know, saying people are over. That's, that's even more emotion. You know, your standard gamer tends to kind of sit between a 7.5 and a 9. Um... But it's it's very rare for gamers to go above, you know, when when people start saying that somebody should lose their job, we know something's really serious. It's not the normal state of affairs for gamers, right? I mean, we normally sort of, we sit around a 6 or a 5.5, you know, eh, resentful, yeah, we usually are, antagonized, yeah, exasperated for sure, you know. But we, we don't tend to want vengeance. Not really. I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, the, the achievement of multiplayer. You know, I'm not talking about a vengeance kill. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. I, and I think the fact that we're allowed to do that in games means we don't hit that 9.5. But I want to show you the rest of the list, you know. And I, I want to be clear that this is not the same as trolling. It's absolutely not the same as trolling because a troll is completely emotionally detached from what they're doing, or so they claim. A troll is not terribly interested in the outcome because they find the whole thing funny, so the troll says. The difference between a troll and an outrage warrior is an outrage warrior is actually invested in the outcome. Whereas trolling, you know, you, you push and you push and you push until the person finally blocks you or something. And then you have a good laugh and go, oh, that was fun. You know, it, you're not in it. You're not invested in it, you know, and, and the outrage warriors are very much invested in it. And you'll notice if I go back to, you know, this article from the beginning, this is an article. So, you know, um, about identifying your anger because identifying your anger is the best way to diffuse it. And I've been using that a lot this week, trust me. And the thing about monitoring your anger is that, can I find it here? Um, here we go. The thing about anger getting, as they say, too tight a grip on you is that it substantially reduces your emotional intelligence. What does that mean? Well, it's like, you know, um, your ability to understand emotions, essentially. The other thing about anger is, and, and this is an interesting thing, anger is, and, and if you read this guy's other stuff, he gets into it more, um, Anger, they're finding more and more and more, is a secondary emotion. Anger is most accurately understood as a potent psychological defense against a variety of more distressing emotions that underlie it. And we tapped into that last week a lot. You know, I started talking about those, you know, the 
You'll see them down here. Concealed beneath your anger, maybe feelings of disappointment, anxiety, worry, or fear, sadness, jealousy, guilt, or shame, embarrassment, or humiliation, or an exasperating sense of powerlessness. I think that last one is really critical. Um, it goes on to talk about core hurts, such as feeling disregarded, unimportant, accused, big one, uh, as in made to feel devalued, rejected, powerless, unlovable, in the stream, unfit for all human contact. I've been hearing those exact words come out of gamers who have been so upset about the, the, the various articles that have everybody in a tizzy, you know, have everybody hovering around that nine on uh, the anger scale. Uh, it's almost the exact words, things like rejected, you know, un, un, inhuman I keep hearing they're treating us as inhuman and the interesting thing about hearing people say that is that that means that at least those gamers that that verbalize that to me or you know wrote it are in touch enough with their emotions to identify that which means they're further ahead than the people who are saying they're just pissed off okay so that automatically blows away the stereotype of gamers that, you know, low emotional intelligence, prone to anger. Um, gamers are, are getting it. Gamers have put a pin in, you know, core hurts. These are core hurts. And core hurts means they're exceptionally important. They, they cut us to our core. And so, I mean, a message like gamers are over. Gamers don't have to be your audience. Gamers are misogynist neckbeards. We've got disregarded. We've got, you know, gamers aren't important. It, it's an accusation you know, for sure, definitely devalued, rejected, all this stuff. So if we understand anger, we can draw a direct line between what touched such a nerve, right? And once you understand that, all this, you know, rhetoric about hate groups and this, that, and the next thing goes away. Because when you recognize that, no, I mean... Hate groups aren't, aren't motivated by core hurts. They're, they're motivated by hate. And hate and anger aren't the same thing. It's very important to know the difference. And, you know, when, when we have something so specific here that we can identify as, as legitimate, legitimate human emotion from psychologists, you'll note the website. This isn't somebody's blog. This is psychology today. Okay, which does have a blog component, but by psychologists. Let me see if I can find the credentials of this guy before we move forward. Um, 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 um. You, know, you can see he's a PhD. Um, does he have a bio? Uh, there you go. Okay, holds doctorates in English and psychology, clinical psychologist and author of Paradoxal Strategies in Psychotherapy. So he has credentials. Okay, so you're not just hearing this from me. You're hearing this from a smart person uh, who has a PhD, two PhDs or something like that. But so what we want to move on to now, this is another article. One thing about outrage warriors is instead of identifying those core hurts that many gamers have expressed to me, and again, I want to remind you that the ability to express those core hurts is a sign of emotional maturity. It's showing that that particular person who identified that feeling is mature enough to yield and actually identify the thing that's really bothering them. That's important to remember that it actually is a sign of maturity. Because what an outrage warrior does is what it says here in this article. It's an article called about what your anger may be hiding. And one of the things anger may be hiding is the low road to self-empowerment. And isn't that, you know, doesn't that just make absolute sense? These outrage warriors latch onto causes that are about empowerment, but they're really just using them to target their anger. And there are reasons for that. And it says anger can help us self-medicate against all sorts of psychological pain. It is equally effective in helping ward off exasperating feelings of powerlessness. There's that power dynamic again, right? And here again, this is part of the other 
the article if you want to read it go back hormonal account of anger is suggested now that doesn't mean like hormones like testosterone and estrogen it means um things like you know analgesia like basically like you know painkiller type thing amphetamine like hormone anger actually produces epinephrine which is a surge of energy it's like you know red bull red bull gives you pissed off um you know, it, 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 you know, it produces things to like take away the hurt and things to crank us so that, you know, that rush outrage warriors are doing it for the rush, but it's important to keep in mind that they're running from psychological pain. So all of a sudden the stuff that's going on in university campuses and on the internet and all this stuff makes a lot more sense when someone can't calm down and have a dialogue when they are constantly engaged in you know the politics of shame in these bully movements in these things that are all about making as much noise as possible and feeling you know that moral component of anger that i talked about in the last thing i showed you guys that's covering up some you know deep psychological pain so can we reason with these people no we can't and i wish that companies would sort of understand this stuff better because when you get these ongoing waves of complaints like it's this email campaign and this email campaign and this email campaign you know they're not logical anymore when you've got waves and waves and waves of them you know, and this, this is what you have to be careful about when you're organizing these movements. You have to make sure that a, a letter writing campaign or a boycott campaign doesn't turn into an outrage campaign. And that's really tough because it requires a lot of maturity, right? Because doing something feels good. Being a part of something feels good. And as we see, you know, getting angry actually releases enjoyable chemicals in our brains. Why would the human brain do that to us? Would it create something so, you know, the, the, the snooty word is toxic, right? Well, that's what I want to talk to about transferring feelings of guilt, hurt, and fear through anger. Because guilt, hurt, and fear are essentially the things that anger is, is trying to protect us against. As human beings, we can only take so much guilt, hurt, and fear on a given day. And in, in an age where we are inundated with mass media, we know that mass media cultivates concepts, you know, cultivates a feeling of fear. For sure, we know that. Television does. Okay? We know that. And that, that's not just somebody with, you know, some, some BS master's degree saying this. We, th there have been studies and studies and studies and studies that have proven the, the cultivated mean world syndrome of television. We, we can accept that. There's a lot of guilt in our political correct, politically correct age. And obviously there's a lot of hurt out there. I hear stories of hurt day after day after day after day. And, you know, I'll say again, I am so grateful and I am so humbled when people share the stories of their hurts with me instead of resorting to anger. I think it's just this beautiful thing because it's a moment of trust, isn't it? When someone tells you something hurtful, like expresses a hurt of theirs, they're telling you because they trust you enough that you're not going to attack them for it. And that's what we need to have a dialogue in gaming. That's what we need in gaming. We need that trust. Trust is a word I've heard a long time. I've heard a lot over the last year. You know, we need to rebuild trust. So what I'm going to show you is the reason that trust isn't being rebuilt, rebuilt. And it's all down to anger transference. Okay. I'm going to jump over the, um, original example, uh, because it's got to do with kids. It's basically when you're a kid, you know, that I didn't do it, even though you did, you know, I didn't do it. She did it, even though you did it. You know, that that's the example. It doesn't really apply here, but but what we're talking about here is the the what I'm applying this to is the the uh, mounting um 
moral pain Olympics that we see the the idea Gamergate is a harassment movement or you know these horrible SJWs did this it's all transference behaviors okay it it all is when you're pointing out what the other side is doing that is a transference and don't take my word for it you know read read these articles and articles like it because this is he's not the only person writing about this but um why why does it happen and it says you'll you'll see this projecting our mistakes misdeeds onto others represents a psychological defense that while it may protect our ego typically creates far more problems than it solves and i understand that this is going to be difficult for some people to accept now i accept that what's about to follow is going to be difficult for some people to accept because they're not quite ready to accept it and that's okay what i ask is that before you leave that nasty comment or you start snarking at me on twitter i ask you to just consider the idea that this is something difficult because it's connected to those core hurts and just trust me on this okay you might not quite get it yet but if you keep working down on this road you will get it and you'll feel a lot better so what i'm asking people to do is not lash out the way somebody inevitably does on every video i do on something even remotely touchy and and try to just listen and and just sort of absorb the idea you don't have to agree with it yet i'm just asking people to absorb it and i want you to think about what happened has happened in the past year in gaming based on these ideas and you know the whole the, a good deal of our anger is motivated by a desire to not experience guilt and beyond this the distressing emotions of hurt and fear it's by now generally agreed upon that anger as prevalent as it is in our species is always n almost never a primary emotion for underlining it. And this is the guy that he referenced earlier. Underlying it are such core hurts as, and those are those core hurts we're back to. So that, that group of articles just over a year ago, could very well have been a bunch of people trying to avoid feeling guilt. And I find there's a lot of this in gaming, especially when it comes to the treatment of women. And that's what sparked the whole thing off, right? There's this real apparent feeling of collective guilt in, in video games regarding how women are treated. And people go out of their way, they twist themselves into pretzels to try to either avoid feeling guilt surrounding the treatment of women in gaming or avoid feeling hurt and fear regarding the treatment of women in gaming. And this is something that we have to really, really get better at understanding because I think it's at the core of this seemingly insurmountable divide. And I'm hearing a lot of people ready to give up ever getting past it. And I don't believe that. I think because, you know, if we sit back and watch it, we can identify these, these tells you know, if we can really get to what's at the core of what's going on, we can stop acting like baby jackasses and start actually communicating with each other, right? So, um, you know, talks about core hurts, whatever, whatever, whatever. Those of us who routinely use anger as a cover-up to keep our more vulnerable feelings at bay generally become so adept at doing so that we have little to no awareness of the dynamic driving our behavior enter tons of op-ed columnists working in the media today okay what's at the core of this tendency in op-ed columnists that anger is the emotion of invulnerability in gaming we have a unique thing where we have a lot of introverts playing at being extroverts when they become op-ed writers but you feel intensely vulnerable. I know because I'm an introvert and I had to learn to make that work for me instead of trying to fight against it. Okay. Um, 
it seems to me that we have quite a few op-ed writers who seem to feel like they're under constant threat and the way they see themselves is constantly under threat. And so they wrap themselves in the emotion of invulnerability when they hit their keyboard. And that's unfortunate, but it's very, very human. Uh, then you get, and, and okay, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Um, it's very human because it's a psychological defense. Okay. Psychological defenses allow us to escape upsetting, shameful, or anxiety laden feelings. We may not have developed the emotional resources or ego strength to successfully cope with. Trust me, guys, nobody has the ego strength to cope with the internet as it currently is. We all have coping mechanisms. We all have our defenses. Some of them are more healthy than others, but you know, it is what it is. Everybody's got their things they need to deal with what is, you know, a real difficult charged environment. And they, they talk about, you know, they use examples of a couple because that's what most people are doing. But I'm going to I'm going to change it to the language of gamers where we're getting to at the end is you're the one who's bad. OK. And that's pretty much what happened just over a year ago um, is that a bunch of articles came out telling gamers you're the one who's bad. Well, it's just a transference, right? It's rather than a suitably sharing your hurt feelings and risk making yourself more vulnerable to these people, you may react instead by finding something to attack them for. Welcome to the cycle we've been in for the last year. OK. That's where we're at. Where we're at. While you're engaged in such retaliatory pursuits, guess what? Presto, you're no longer feeling demeaned, at least not in the moment, which sadly enforces this essentially childish behavior, as in you're the one who's bad. And that's what we've been seeing for the last year, an undeclared, largely unrecognized game of tit for tat. <laughs> I said tit. You laughed at that. Come on. I'm trying to keep the pressure down, okay? Because I know this is hard for people to. But here's what happens to the people who are, you know, uh, a uh, recipient of that fit of temper. And this is where, you know, we're going to get into that tit-for-tat fight of who started it. And at this point, you know, we're talking about a building conflict that go goes all the way back to when did Gertzman Gate happen? 2007, 2006, something like that. So figuring out who the hell started it, it's too hard to untangle at this point. But what happens to somebody when you unload on them with gamers and misogynist neckbeards, okay? Now they feel the burden you've just managed to shake off. Whatever feelings of hurt you were experiencing has been passed on or transferred to them. And their initial reaction may not be one, not simply of hurt, but fear as well. And I've been hearing a lot of that, that gamers are afraid that these, you know, outrage warriors are going to come and change their games, take away the games. I've felt I've heard a lot of condescending you know no one wants to change your games or no one wants to take away your games we just want something better but what this article is saying is that fear is a natural reaction to anger transference okay because at the most primitive instinctual level by experiencing themselves as the object of your anger they unconsciously grasp that you harbor the hostile impulse to harm them and all of a sudden, all this stuff that people dismissed as crazy or irrational or all this stuff, well, it's actually very human. Now, the next step, because something else happened, wasn't it? And, and this article pretty much draws it out. Their own defensive reaction is likely in counter-retaliation, as it were, to be one of you of one of blaming you right back, which can in turn escalate the conflict between the two of you with lightning speed. Here, it's not a physical eye for an eye, but a verbal blow for blow. And hasn't that been the past year? 
you know. And it's really interesting. There's a picture right here of like a woman with brown hair and a white dude yelling at each other. Welcome to freaking gaming for the last year. With, you know, a bunch of other people on the sidelines going, um, um, we exist too. Yeah, it's not a binary paradigm of white, pe white men versus women with brown hair. Or pink hair, or blue hair, or silver hair, as, as the case may be. Um, but I, I really, um, or, you know, here's the other thing that happened. Other possible reactions are for the now distressed recipients of your vengeful criticism to archly defend themselves or leave the scene altogether. And of course, none of these self-protective reactions helps the respondent of your attack understand which has triggered your anger buttons in the first place, which is another reason that anger, despite its ability to offer immediate emotional release and relief from whatever originally provoked it, rarely resolves anything. So this is what we need to get past, guys. So this is me providing a video to those of you who feel that fear that the world is now blaming you for all the bad things that happened to, you know, women in video games. That, you know, according to a very smart psychologist, is a completely normal human reaction, okay? What we've got to do now is move past this cycle of anger and fear. Because I think we just sort of showed that this thing that people are claiming is, you know, a hate movement is, you know, not necessarily so. Very, in fact, likely not so, because the so-called hate movement matches all the things that to a transference of anger. And, I mean, we could go back to stuff I don't like talking about, because I feel like even just talking about certain precursors to uh, August 28th of last year uh, perpetuate it, and I feel like that there are some personal issues there that really needed to die, uh, not people die, okay? Those issues, they have to sort of be buried and left in the past because um, the, the whole thing was sparked off by a very personal, very, a lot of pain becoming very public and people reacting to that. And I think that the people who saw that, especially the people who were in those early days going, what the hell is going on? I think there was so much pain and we reacted so in, in such a human, like empathic way. A, a bunch of people who were in a position to sort of feel that most acutely did not have a very mature response to it. And they sort of went, I'm tired of feeling bad. I'm going to blast all of gaming. And everybody has their limits, but I think that we, we do have a responsibility as, I mean, I, I've talked before about how, you know, games journalist is inaccurate, but games writers, you know, writers is confusing because we don't write the games, we write about these games. Um, gaming thought leaders, I'll say, that's accurate. But the, the thing behind thought leader is that we're actually leaders and leaders lead. Leaders don't react. Leaders set the pace. We're the percussion section of the industry. We're setting the rhythm for everybody else. And so when those thought leaders become, you know, sources of anger that's being transferred to the rest of the community, of course it's going to go boom. Psychologists have documented why. So hopefully this helps give people some tools to start getting beyond, beyond this verbal blow for blow that we've experiencing. Because I tell you, there's some great games coming down the pipe, guys. I'm sampling them right now. And some of them have been totally under the radar because of, you know, the negative messaging in gaming. And I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking like there's some great games coming up for the PlayStation 4 that people got so negative over Uncharted being pushed back that it's like, PlayStation has no exclusives to Christmas. It's garbage. It's absolute garbage. There are some amazing games coming out for the PS4. There are some amazing games coming out for the Xbox. There's some amazing games coming out for Nintendo. And we're so stuck in this self-defensive anger response that we can't talk about what's amazing because people seem to not be able to trust when anybody likes something anymore. But here's the thing. 
leaders like things. Leaders, us thought leaders, and yes, I am including myself in that. It's high time I did that. I am a thought leader. Thought leader of, no, <laughs> not that kind of leader, guys. Um, but I, I know there's this fear and resentment towards leaders in gaming. You know, there's, there's no leaders of, you know, that movement. Um, but I think there are thought leaders. And I think that when, when you assume a role, and I don't think anybody signs up for it, I think you'd have to be a complete narcissist to want it. But you end up here. I mean, I've become aware that people actually do listen to me and it's like, I have to be more careful. I have to set a good example. And that's what leadership is. And that's what gaming is lacking. It's lacking people who are willing to go, I've, I've been elected to this spot by the people who give a damn about what I have to say. And it, you know, it's not millions of people in my case, it's thousands, but still there are thousands of people that listen what I have to say every day. And so I have to start, well, I have been doing it, but you know, I'm, I'm telling you guys, you can't just go, I'm not a leader. When you've got thousands of people listening to you every day, you absolutely are. And you have to start acting like it because that's the only way to have a proactive, have a conscious effect on gaming. When you become a leader, you have to stop seeking acceptance because you have to realize you've been accepted. You know, when, when 2,000 people or 45,000 people or however many thousand people, when you hit four or five, six, seven figures of people watching you every single blinking day, it's incredibly immature to still be looking for acceptance. Those numbers should indicate you have been accepted by a fairly large plurality. And it's time to start acting like it, you know, which is one of the lessons for me for the past year. It's sort of like you go past that Kool-Aid point, which I don't know if you guys know what the Kool-Aid point is. It's that point where people think, oh my God, people are listening to this person. They have to be destroyed on the internet. The thing about the Kool-Aid point is it's really, you haven't really achieved anything when you first hit the Kool-Aid point. So there's this massive amount of imposter syndrome that comes with the Kool-Aid point. And I got extremely angry at someone who decided to tell me my experience regarding the Kool-Aid point. And I haven't spoken to the dude since. Uh, and there's a reason for that because you don't talk about the Kool-Aid point with someone who's at the Kool-Aid point. It's the wrong time. But the thing I realized about the Kool-Aid point, and, and it backs up what I was saying at the time, no, you don't reach that point because of achievement. You reach that point because you're starting to maybe sort of baby steps achieve. The real achievement comes once people start watching you. And once you actually have to get a track record or a voting record, for lack of a better term. That's why it's always easy to attack an incumbent, right? If somebody has no record, there's nothing to attack. Uh, an incumbent, an incumbent thought leader in gaming has all these black marks that people can pick at. And people don't normally see the positives they've done. But I think that's also because not enough people in gaming feel an adequate amount of responsibility for accumulating those positives. And that's where the achievement comes in. After you've hit that Kool-Aid point, once people are watching and once you've had those first few colossal dog piles and brigades that's when the real shit starts and there are a lot of people i think just waking up to that because a lot of people suddenly became very public people in the wake of the past year and that's when you start going okay people are listening people are paying attention to me for for better or for worse they're paying attention what the hell do i do with it now and that's where the real leaders emerge that's where the real leadership emerges. Okay, you've got this audience. What the hell do you do with it? Are you going to be a force for positive change? Or are you going to be a force to perpetuate negativity? The leaders perpetuate positive change. And that's what we need in gaming. We need true thought leaders. We don't need outrage warriors. We need leaders, not warriors. I guess that's the takeaway. Take 
And what's the thing about a soldier? A soldier doesn't lead. A soldier follows. So if you're proudly flying that warrior flag, if you're proudly flying that outrage warrior flag, you're not leading. And that's a wake up call I think a lot of people need. Because leaders are willing to be temporarily despised to create permanent good. Okay. They're, they're prepared to be thoroughly disliked when they think it's the right thing to do. And isn't that rare in gaming these days? Everybody wants that next hit. Everybody's like, you know, oh, got to do the next one. Got to do the next one. Got to keep the YouTube counts up. Got to build, got to build, got to build. Got to add those followers, right? And people start freaking out. Oh my God, I lost 50, 50 subscriptions because a whole bunch of people rage quit because they didn't like what you had to say. Well, the leader is going to suck that up. Uh, an outrage warrior is going to get back on message and scream even louder to get those 50, 75, 100 people back, right? And that's what we've got a bunch of in gaming right now, just because they're succumbing, they're being a soldier to the way the internet works and YouTube and subscriber-based systems work instead of becoming a leader within that system. And it's ironic that leadership became this pejorative for a while over the past year. And I understand why, I'm not knocking it. But it became like this pejorative and then this joke and then this thing that people were afraid of assuming. And at the end of it, it it's really what gaming needs. is, And people want leaders they can believe in. But leaders you believe in have to be past this anger stuff and understand it. And that doesn't mean people are never going to get angry. It just means when you catch yourself being angry, you go, why am I angry? Why is this pissing me off so much? And if you're not willing to explore why you're that angry, if you're willing to just of other people names instead of going no this is why I'm upset this is why it bothers me and this is why I think it's not good for gaming you don't deserve to be a leader and you're not a leader you're an outrage warrior okay so that's that but because it's mountain Monday we're gonna go back to our mountain because this is how mountain Mondays end for those of you who are watching because of the title and not because it's mountain Monday that was heavy. So we're going to end the way we began. And, you know, Mountain Monday veterans know, you know, you're going to be the leaders of Mountain Monday, guys. Now, if you know what to do, sort of channel that energy into the internet and help other people, you know, sort of center after the, the difficult thoughts. And thanks for staying with me. This one was longer than I expected it to be. They always are. Oh, my God, because I feel the need to clarify concepts so much that I end up talking way longer than I mean to. But... So now we're going to come back in for landing and, and find our center because I don't want people to walk away angry. I want people to walk away informed, right? Enlightened. So we're going to breathe in. And out. Yes, I'm taking extra deep breaths because I want the calming. And breathe in. And out. Have a good week, everybody.